Okay, our passage for today is going to be Titus chapter 2, uh, verses 11 to 15. Titus chapter 2, uh, verses 11 to 15. Let me go ahead and read it. It says, For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions, and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession, who are zealous for good works." Declare these things, exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no one disregard you. So this, I know I still like say this all the time, um, but th this is a passage that I think would be, you'd be really wise in our day and age to commit to your memory. And, and if you don't necessarily memorize every single word, know what the text is about and know where to find it. Because it, 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 as we, as things continue to go, what I, what it, I, I have very obviously limited knowledge, but it seems to me that the people who have been saved and whom the grace of God is dwelling in, the saving grace of God, it feels like to me they're getting stronger and brighter. And it feels like the fake nonsense around us is getting darker and darker. And that is going to lead to more and more kind of collisions. And one of the great false doctrines of the day in the compromising church or in the fake church are false doctrines and false and demonic applications of the grace of God. And so I think this passage, as you watch it all held together in the flow and, and everything that's in this text, Paul gives us a definition of grace that is biblical, that is godly, and that... If you store it in your mind and understand it, it's going to equip you very well to deal with a lot of nonsense that's going on that's very relevant to our day. So to begin the sermon and to talk about in the introduction, I would first just put forth to you, what's grace? You just sang about it. You said it was amazing. God's unmerited favor. Okay. Good. God's unmerited favor. Anything else? Any other thoughts? That's correct. Do we all know what that means? God's unmerited favor. How would you break it down? What would use your own words to say it differently? Huh? Yeah. Plagiarize <laughs> Jason right now unto the Lord. Plagiarize Jason. Here we go. What does it mean for it to be unmerited? Okay, good. Yeah, we don't deserve it. God's grace is this, this favor that he gives us that we don't deserve. It's not because of us. It doesn't depend on us. It's not because we're righteous. It's not because we're the deal. It's not because we're, you know, s smarter or taller or prettier or uglier or shorter or in my case fatter um it, it's not because any of this stuff god gives grace because god gives grace the giving of the grace of god is dependent 100 percent on the prerogative of god on the plan of god on the purpose of god on the predetermination of god god gives grace to whom he gives grace because god decides it it depends only on God, and 0% it does it depend on man. Now, <clears throat> we gave a little definition of what God's grace is. Here's my next question. We just said it was amazing. Why is it amazing? Okay. Okay. Which is really not awful. Okay. 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 Yeah. All. All right. Things. All right. Things. It's quote. Free. It's free. Okay. Yeah. 
Okay? Yep. Any other thoughts? Quote the great theologian Olaf, all good things, all good things. Any any others? Now, when you look from start to finish what the saving grace of God does for a Christian, it's spectacular. And considering the fact that not only do we not deserve it, um, but we deserve the opposite. We deserve his wrath. There's this amazingness to it that he gives it at all. There's an amazingness to how to what God did to be able to pour it on us. There's an amazingness to what it does to us and for us uh, in this life and in the next. And so when you go layer upon layer upon all the things that grace is, all the ways through which God dispenses it, primarily through the death and resurrection of Christ and who he is, uh, all the things it does for you now and into the future, like it's amazing. So, okay, we gave a short definition of grace. We gave a short definition of why it's amazing. Can someone tell me how is grace perverted in our day? And bonus points if you can give me passages that talk about specifically the perversion of grace. How do we take what we just said was amazing and then twist it into something bad? Yeah, okay, good. Yeah, Romans 6, verse 1 and 2 says, Shall we go on sinning that grace may abound? There are people who say that. Well, hey, we're saved by God's grace. God's gracious. So, hey, let's just go on sinning. What's the big deal? Yes. And then in Jude 1, 4, let's turn to Jude 1 and just read it. Jude 1, we'll start verse 3. He says, Beloved, although I was very eager to write to you about our common salvation, I found it necessary to write appealing to you to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. Okay, He's like, I want to talk about salvation, but I got to write to you to contend for the faith that's once for all delivered to the, to the saints. There's this attack in the book of Jude on the historic Christian faith. It's under attack. And this next verse tells you, a big part of the attack, verse 4. For certain people have crept in unnoticed. Where have they crept in? Church. Church. And they crept in unnoticed. Meaning, when they came in, people did, these are bad guys, by the way, which will become clear by the end of the text. When they came in, it wasn't immediately obvious that they were bad guys. They came in, they look like Christians, they talk like Christians, they act like Christians, they've crept in, they're not noticed. They're not noticed that they're obviously antithetical to the faith. They look the part. And here's what it says. Certain people have crept in unnoticed, who long ago were designated for this condemnation. Ungodly people who pervert the grace of God into sensuality, and deny our only master and Lord, Jesus Christ. So these guys who come in, they creep into the church and they're unnoticed. It says they deny our only master and Lord, Jesus Christ. Well, if they walked into the church saying, Jesus isn't Lord, Jesus is not our master, they wouldn't go unnoticed. I don't think that's the way they're denying him. How are they denying the Lord Jesus Christ? Yeah, they pervert grace into this justification of, in this case, sensuality or any other sin. And so when you take the saving grace of God and you say, I'm just, hey man, it's, it's all grace. I get the gospel. I get grace. I get the love of God to stay in unrepentant sin. You are doing what? Denying the master, our Lord Jesus Christ. There's no way these guys are going to creep into the church unnoticed if they walk up saying, Jesus is not Lord, he's not the man, that, that's not it. When you turn grace into a justification for sin, you have denied the master. And not only have you denied the master, but he says, what else did Jude say? He said, what else did he say is true of these guys? Look at verse 4. <clears throat> Oh, sorry, I'm reading Revelation. I was like, why doesn't it say the same thing? <laughs> That's why. Verse 4. 
Certain persons of crept in unnoticed long ago. Look, designated for condemnation. They're ungodly people. Okay, These are ungodly people designated for condemnation. They creep into the church. They're not noticed as unbelievers immediately, but by their life and what they end up sowing through their wrong ideas and false teachings and through their own life, they end up sowing this reality or they end up sowing this false reality that, hey, the grace of God justifies sin. This isn't like they're just off a little bit. Like this is pass fail stuff for Christianity. Like these guys are designated for condemnation and they're ungodly. And if you read the rest of the book of Jude, I mean, they're, they're terrible. And so this ancient attack on the grace of God. It's not just our day. Paul writes about it in Romans 6. As I just mentioned here, Jude talks about it. There have been, ever since Jesus ascended into heaven, there has been this attack on the saving grace of God by Satan that just twists it into something that justifies sin. Oh, hey, it do well. Yeah, I guess I shouldn't do that. But hey, it's all the grace of God. It's all under the blood. And yeah, I'm walking in this unrepentant sin. I won't deal with it. But hey, I'm, I, we're not saved by works. We're saved by grace. I've heard that stuff in churches 800 million times. I've heard it in conversations with Christians outside of churches 800 million times. And I, I personally believe this is the biggest doctrinal attack on the professing church in the United States. There are, you know, different seasons. There are other attacks. There's legalism and there are other types of things. But I think this is the biggest one in our day and in our battle. And so for you to serve your king valiantly, for you to be really, to be in salt and light in this day and age, you got to know Titus too. Here's another statement I want to share with you as we go into this text. I have seen this... I've heard this said, I've heard this preached from sermons, I've seen it posted on Facebook, I've heard conversations like this in the last 20 years that go like this. It says, hey, you know, I'm not a Pharisee. I know I'm not perfect. I know I'm a sinner. I know I'm messed up. And you know what? I like to hang out with people who know they're messed up because we don't act like we have it all together. We know that we need the grace of God and we need the gospel. And so we just hang out together and help each other realize that. Now, let me ask you a question. What's wrong with that? I don't think there's anything wrong with it except... I think it's incomplete. How could you misuse that statement? Though that, that we say all these things, therefore, well, it excuses you from doing anything that you want. Or, uh, yeah. 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 Okay. You can. Here's what I'm trying to say. You can say all those truths, which are they're all true, but depending on what you do with it determines, I believe, if you're in grievous error, you might not even be saved, depending on what you do with it. When people come together knowing that they're sinners, that we should all know that. You know I'm a sinner, I know you're a sinner. We know that. We know we need the grace, saving grace of God, and we need the gospel, and we need to look to Christ. We need to encourage each other in those things. But Hebrews 10 says we need to stir one another up towards what? Love and good deeds. We need to push each other in a godly way to obey God, to turn from sin, to stop walking in this stuff. Now, real saints will respond to that. Fakes will get super bent. They'll get all mad. They'll be hardened. They'll start attacking the church. And when you try to push them to obeying God, they'll say they're triggered. Like it's real Christians are going to respond and obey. Real Christians are going to want holiness. They want obedience. They're not just trying to figure out how much can I get away with. They are pressing into Christ. 
and the fake church is going to get vicious and attack anybody who says, hey, let's press into obedience. Let's press into repentance. They'll start attacking people who say that, and then they will do it saying that they are upholding a biblical view of the grace of God, and you're a legalist because you say we need to obey and repent. Now, what we're going to do is test that nonsense against the Word of God. So, as I mentioned, Titus 2, verse 11 through 15, I recommend that you at least memorize the flow because this is a text that is all about the grace of God. Everything we see in the text, the grace of God is doing all of it to Christians. So we're going to break it down piece by piece. Let's say grace, saving grace of God does X, Y, Z. We're going to fill in all the blanks here. So that's the roadmap uh, for this passage. Let's go ahead and begin uh, in verse 11, Titus chapter 2. It says, The grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people. That's the first verse. We're going to start there. Grace of God. First thing we notice about grace of God is that it brings salvation. It is absolutely impossible as sinners to approach a holy God whose standards are perfection, who is so pristine that living beings die in his presence. It is impossible for me and you who are so deeply marked with sin, who are by nature under the judgment of God, who we, we've done countless wrong in our thoughts, in our speech, and in our actions. It is impossible for us to be accepted by God on our, our own merits, on our own righteousness. You are not good enough for God. I am not good enough for God. Your mom ain't good enough for God. On Mother's Day, there is not one mother on this planet who is good enough for God. All of us are sinful and need to be saved by God. And so the grace of God has appeared and it has brought salvation. Okay? What is the appearing of the saving grace of God? What's he talking about? How has it appeared? For some to appear means it's like visible and present. Poof. There it is. Christ. The saving grace of God, the salvation to come, it was promised in the Old Testament. There were types in the Old Testament. There were covenants created in the Old Testament by God. They're all moving you to His saving grace and His purposes in Christ. But once Jesus steps onto the planet, once He is born, once He lives out that perfect life and teaches the Word of God and conquers demons and nature and, and death and sin and hell and Satan, once he did all this stuff, this is the saving grace of God that is visibly, manifestly appeared. Jesus died on a cross. He bore our sin. He really did. It was a historical event. A real person named Jesus Christ was really on planet Earth. He really, in a physical body, lived out a sinless life. In a physical body, he really died on a cross. In a physical body, he really rose from the dead. And in all of these things, everything involved in his birth, his life, his death, his resurrection, his ascension, he achieved salvation. And that salvation comes by the grace of God. Christ is the one who saved us. If you are a Christian and every single person who truly knows God who will be in heaven, they will be in heaven exclusively because of the reality that Christ saved them. You and I contribute nothing to our salvation. It was a gift achieved for you by Jesus Christ, given to you freely when you received him in faith. To achieve salvation, there's nothing you can do to do that except to respond in faith and repentance. A couple of passages that talk about that, or maybe, maybe I'll just read one. Galatians chapter 2, uh, verse 15 and 16. Listen here. Paul says, We ourselves are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners, yet we know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. So we also have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law, because by works of the law, 
no one will be justified. You want to try to approach Christ in your, God in your works, all you're going to prove is that you're a sinner and that you're condemned and that you're worthy of hell. Every single Christian must approach God by faith in Christ to receive His grace that saves us. It's greater than all of your sin. All of the sin that you've ever committed and all of the sin I've ever committed and all of the sin of the history of every person who will be saved, if you take all of our sins, every believer ever, you know the Abraham's offspring, as numerous as the sand on the seashore, every believer whoever will be saved, ever has been saved, take all of our sins and, and put it in like a big bottle or a bowl. God's grace is greater than all of it. Because at the cross of Christ, the death of Jesus was so perfect. It was so powerful. It was so enormous. It was so glorious. When you have God the Son in a human body paying for sins, that reality is so powerful that it erases every single sin. It is literally the only thing more powerful than the collective of human sin is the grace of God. That's the only thing more powerful. Christ took every single sin that you've ever committed and ever will commit, and that I've ever committed. I mean, we just took the sins in this room, which isn't a very big room. That's a lot of sins. Then take every believer and put it all on Christ. He bore it all. There's nothing greater than the cross of Christ, not even sin. And so he, having paid for our sins and risen from the dead, he now offers us salvation through faith and repentance. And it is a gift that you receive. It's not something you can earn. So the grace of God has appeared, according to Paul in verse 11, bringing salvation. And we know from, obviously, Paul's theology, it's salvation in Christ, as I've just explained. So, for grace to truly be operative in you, is saving grace dwelling within me? You ask that question, well, here's, the, here's one way to tell. Are you hoping in yourself for salvation, or things that you do for your salvation, or is your hope built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness? A Christian's saving, the saving grace at work in a Christian means the Christian's all of his hope or, his, or her hope is in Christ for salvation. That's first thing. Okay. Next observation in our passage, it says the grace of God is appear bringing salvation for all people. Okay, now let me ask you this. Does this mean every individual is saved when Paul says grace has brought salvation for all people? It does not, according to Jason. Is he right? And does anybody, can anyone give us a text? What was the question? The, the uh, verse 11 says, The grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people. Does that mean every individual is saved who's ever lived? No. No, okay, well, how do you know? You're right, but how do you know? We know unbelievers. <laughs> okay, you know unbelievers. Fair enough. <laughs> Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's for those who believe. Not, or, go ahead. Not all who say, Lord, Lord. Yeah. Not all who say, Lord, 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 enter the kingdom of heaven. All right. There's tons of passages about God's judgment for the unbeliever, right? Titus chapter one, he talks about false teachers at the end of chapter 1. So you know if you've just been reading the flow, there's no way everybody's saved based on Titus 1. Titus chapter 3, 10, 11. Um, for, sorry. <coughs> Thank you. People under church discipline, according to Titus 3, 10, 11, who are rightly under church discipline, he says they're warped, self-condemned. There's this condemnation upon them if they, if they refuse to repent. And so we know from Paul's theology and from the theology of the Bible 
that and, and, and one one last one, second Thessalonians chapter one is super clear verses I believe five to ten that there's this wrath coming on those who do not obey the gospel and their presence is eternal destruction away from the Lord. Like Paul's theology and the biblical theology is not every individual is saved. So if every individual, if it doesn't mean what it said, when Paul says God's grace brings salvation for all people, if it doesn't mean every individual is saved, well, what does that mean? What, what all people mean something. If it doesn't mean that, what does it mean? It's available to all people. Okay. Yeah, salvation is brought to, I, I believe, all types of people. Every personality type, every socioeconomic class, people from every nation, right? That's Abrahamic covenant. All nations will be blessed through you. There are going to be in heaven people saved from literally every walk of life throughout history. Stone Age tribes and, you know... Rich dudes and poor dudes and everything in between and good athletes and bad athletes and smart people and not so smart people. And I mean, every single type of person that exists, God is going to save people from every arena of life. And so if you want to See, if you are someone who has a heart full of the saving grace of God, one of the things you can ask yourself is, does your heart understand that God saves all types of people? And are you willing to engage all types of people in love and with the gospel? Or are there certain types of people I just won't even interact with them? I don't like whatever. I don't like... Jews. I don't like Mexicans. I don't like rich people. I don't like poor people. I don't like loud people. I don't like quiet people. I don't know whatever it is. When some, when a Christian says these people groups, I don't like those kinds of people. I'm not even going to interact with them. A Christian is telling on themselves that there's a short circuiting of grace in your heart. God has saved people from every walk of life and he is saving people from every walk of life grace in your heart means you have a heart for anybody to be saved i remember when i felt called to the ministry these pastors were asking me well where do you feel called i was like i don't know i was like i just i just want to see anybody get saved and uh i, I was like i can't even tell you and now, <laughs> now I definitely have heart for certain areas. I don't think that's evil if you have a heart for a certain people group or a certain area. But if it's at the exclusion of someone else, I think that's really wrong. Is God is saving middle class America, poor America, rich America, the Philippines, Japanese, Malaysia, whatever you want, you want to think of. Salvation's come to all people types and all people groups. And so when grace is operative in your heart, you want to move towards all types of people with the gospel to minister to them because that's what God has done. And so this is a test of grace in your heart. If you're going to say, I won't talk to the freshman because I'm a junior, there's something wrong with you. If you're going to say, I won't talk to seniors because I'm a sophomore or a freshman or whatever, there's something, something's going, something's wrong. Like something's wrong. I don't talk to loud people. They're annoying. I don't talk to quiet people. They never say anything. Like it doesn't matter what type of person God puts in your life. You need to move towards them and engage them for the gospel. This is how part of how you know grace is alive in you is I want to move towards all types of people with the Lord. As soon as you make, I will move toward, I'll only move towards certain types of people. I'll only move towards, you know, Nuggets fans or whatever. Like there's something wrong in your heart. And so God's grace has brought salvation. God's grace has brought it for all types of people. If we're going to understand God's grace, then these things need to be alive in us. All right. Any questions or comments on that before we move to the next thing of what God's grace does? Okay. 
Let's go ahead. We're going to look into the next verse. Verse 11 it says, look, the grace of God has appeared, right? Grace of God is what has appeared and the great bringing salvation for all people. What's bringing salvation for all people? The grace of God. Now look at the next verse. It's still the grace of God that is doing the things in verse 12. Training us. So now God's grace isn't just saving us. It is also training us. And it's training us to do something specific. Training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions. Okay? This is what God's grace does. It trains you to renounce ungodliness. It trains you to renounce worldly passions. What's another thing? What's a, what's a synonym for this? If I say God's grace is training me to renounce ungodliness and sinful passions, what's, a, what's another thing I could say God's grace is training me to do? What are you doing when you're renouncing ungodliness? Specifically your ungodliness. Repenting. Repenting. I have heard the significant theological error among people, especially heard this 10, 15 years ago with a group I was involved with, where there were people who made a profession of faith and then they would start walking in sin. And people around me were saying, well, they don't understand the law yet. We got to teach them the law so that they will start obeying God. And my argument was, I was like, the problem isn't they don't understand the law. I think the problem is, or they would say they got the grace of God. They just don't understand the law because they're not repenting of their sins. That's what they would say. And I was like, eh, I think they're misunderstanding grace, not misunderstanding the law. And the reason I would say that is because grace, tra the same grace that saves you, trains you to repent. It trains you to renounce your sins, to renounce ungodliness. And so if you are a Christian who claims that God grace, God's grace has saved you, if it's not also training you to repent, you have no reason to believe God's grace has saved you. You can't chop this up. God's grace is training us to renounce ungodliness. And so when you are a Christian and you're interacting with the commandments of God, the commandments of God, they're good. Paul says that the law is good. The commandments of God, what do they tell you? I mean, besides like what God commands, like they tell you that. And so flesh that out a little bit more. If you were me, what does it tell you? The commands of God. Yeah, the commandments of God are going to decide, define sin. Commandments of God will define love. They'll define obedience. They'll, they'll teach you what God's will is, what's pleasing to him, what's grievous to him. The commandments themselves can't change you. You guys understand that? Don't kill your neighbor. That's not going to change your heart. What does change you, according to this passage? The grace of God. But when you look at the commands, the commands tell you what God desires. The commands aren't bad. The commands are only bad if obedience to commandments is your hope for salvation. Or if you think the commandments are going to change you. They're not going to change you. They can't save you. These commands of God are going to teach you that you have sinned. That's the first thing they're going to teach you. Is that you're a sinner and you haven't kept the commandments. The commandments are going to drive you to Jesus. Where you need to be saved by his grace through faith alone. But then as a Christian the commandments are going to instruct you about what God's will is, what is right, what is wrong, how should I be living my life? Now, if I find as a Christian I have sin in my life, it's not the commandment that's going to change me, it's the grace of God that's going to change me and produce in me a renunciation of ungodliness, a renunciation of worldly passions. God's grace trains you to renounce sin. And if God's grace, if you are not, if you do not have a lifestyle of renouncing your sin and repenting from your sin, and then you say, oh, I'm saved by the grace of God, you're probably not saved by the grace of God. Because the same grace that saves you 
trains you to renounce sin and ungodliness and worldly passions. This is what grace does. This is a powerful definition of grace. So the person who says, hey, man, we're, I'm saved by grace. I'm not saved by works. Yeah, I probably shouldn't do this, but who cares? Grace is not saving grace of God. You're evidencing that the saving grace of God's not at work in you. Let's keep reading this, this verse. Verse 12. Grace of God, according to verse 12, is training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age. So now, we're not only being trained by the grace of God to renounce our sins, but we're also being trained to be proactively obedient, to live self-controlled, upright, godly lives. Grace trains you to do that. And notice it trains you to do that, it says, in this present age, right now. Sometimes people say, well, uh, you know, I'm not going to be obedient until the second coming. I won't have any sin. Then that's what it comes. That's the age to come. Right now, God's grace doesn't just save you. It teaches you to repent and it teaches you to obey God. Self-controlled, upright, godly lives in this present age. Now, for those of you who are grammarians, your grammar people, the subject is still the grace of God. It is still doing everything in the text. It's saving you, teaching you to repent, it's teaching to obey. Disobedient, unrepentant, professing Christians who say they're saved by the grace of God are deceived. They're right that the grace of God saves you, but they're deceived about themselves. Please see this connection in this verse. The same grace that saves you teaches you to repent and trains you to obey in this present age. I didn't write it. That's what it says. And it's not complicated. And I will also give you this. This is for free. Anyone who tries to overcomplicate this verse, anyone who could, when you, when you lay this out for someone and they turn around and want to complicate everything, guarantee you, I guarantee you, there's something in their life that they're trying to justify or something in someone's life whom they love that they're trying to justify and they don't want to see reality. So they're going to twist. Oh, what? We got to be perfect now. And you know, all that. it's like, that's not what this text is saying. It's not what it's saying, but they will twist it all up and they'll put your head in a blender because they, and they'll be vicious about it and very passionate about it because they got to hold on to those sins and still believe they're saved. Or they got to still look at their loved one who is clearly not walking in this way. But they got to make themselves feel better that they're still saved. They won't face reality. They won't face the truth. This is not complicated. The grace that saves you teaches you to repent and it teaches you to obey in this life. Any questions? It is not complicated in the least. So now, as we move to verse 13, in like this massive run-on sentence, we will see, so you think I'm bad, like I'm not nearly as bad as this passage. Now we're going to see what grace does in verse 13. Now this is a little bit, this may not be quite as obvious to somebody that grace does this. Verse 13, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Here's the next thing grace does. Grace teaches you to wait on your blessed hope, the appearing of Christ. Grace trains you to wait by faith on the second coming. How many times have you heard somebody say, man, how are you doing this week? Oh man, dude, the grace of God is just teaching me to hope in the second coming. It's rare you hear people talk like that. But according to this passage, grace teaches you to hope in the second coming. Now tell me, how does hoping in the second coming 
Why would you think that's a work of grace? What's the connection there? Yeah. Okay. Can't get there without it. Okay. Think about what he said so far. Grace brings salvation, teaches you to renounce sin, teaches you to obey God. Now, the second coming, how does the second coming relate to those things? Well, first, second coming relates to your salvation in that it's the completion of it. It is totally done. You're resurrected. You're glorified. You're in the presence of God. It is completed at the second coming. Furthermore, repentance. It'll never happen again. Once the second coming comes, all ungodliness is banished forever. Thirdly, the obedience that the grace of God produces in you, it's going to be perfect at the second coming. Like it's all of it's going to be complete. And so when grace saves you, And grace teaches you to leave your sins and to be obedient. Grace is also pointing you to that great day at the appearing of Christ when grace will have completed its work. You'll be perfected in the presence of Christ and every Christian and all evil will be gone. Your salvation is now completed and it was all by His grace. None of us can merit the return of Christ. Not like, oh, you know, Joe finally got it together, so now Jesus is coming back. Like, it it doesn't work that way. Jesus is coming back when Jesus is coming back. And nobody can change that date. And it'll all be by God's grace. And for the church, it will be the completion of our salvation that we will then enjoy for all eternity. So for the Christian whose heart is filled with the grace of God, whose heart is filled with salvation, he becomes, over time, grace teaches him to progressively become eternally minded. Progressively, a growing, maturing Christian understands that these present hardships and tests and trials are to be viewed through an eternal lens. They're not going to last forever. And God's doing something good in me now. And one day it's going to go away. A Christian in whom grace dwells starts to think like this more and more throughout their life. A Christian who is heavenly minded, fixed on the second coming, knows that obedience, no matter what it costs us in this life, is worth it. And sin, no matter what pleasure it promises in this life, is not worth it. An eternally minded person views it that way. An eternally minded person understands that suffering in this life, it's okay. But compromise is not okay. You will be strengthened in viewing it that way when you're eternally minded. When you're not eternally minded and you're earthly minded, you're not going to be strong in these things. An eternally minded person knows that costly faithfulness in this life is worth it because I'm going to see Christ and He will reward me. And so grace trains you to hope in the second coming because of what the second coming means to you. It means the completion of your salvation. It means a reward for your faithfulness. It means you'll see him face to face. And having that ending in sight is the thing that's going to keep you going. 1 John 3, verse 2 and 3, it says, We know when he appears, we'll be just like him. And we'll see him as he is. And whoever has this hope in himself purifies himself as he is pure. It's very similar to what Paul's saying. If grace is alive in you, the saving grace of God dwells in your heart and it fills your mind, then part of what that looks like is you have hope in the second coming. We have to deal with things of this life right now. We do but we deal with them with an eternal perspective. And when that eternal perspective starts to die, your ungodliness will grow and your obedience will weaken. And when that eternal perspective is refreshed in your mind, you leave your sins, you obey God more fully. 
Any questions or thoughts on the connection between the second coming and the grace of God working in your life? All right, let's move to the next reality of grace for the Christian. Let's read verse 13 and 14. Waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. Let's look at the next characteristic here of a grace minded, grace filled Christian. A grace filled Christian knows that we need to be redeemed from our lawlessness. A grace-filled Christian is painfully aware of his sin. A grace-filled Christian knows, I need to be saved by God. A grace-filled Christian knows, I am still fighting sin in this mortal body. A grace-filled Christian knows I still need to live off the grace of God. I'm not perfected. The second coming hasn't happened. I haven't arrived. I've been redeemed from my lawlessness. A grace-filled Christian knows I've broken God's commands. I need to be redeemed from it. Listen, the closer you get to God, the more you're going to understand your sin. Sometimes when a Christian's actually growing, they think they're not growing, but they really are. Here's what I mean. Sometimes the more you get to know the word and the more you truly follow the Lord, God will show you over time the different ways in which we sin. And you're like, whoa. And it can feel like you're not growing. It isn't true. You're just becoming more aware of what your sin is. Our sin is really crafty, guys. And it dwells in all of us. And... Becoming more aware of your sin isn't a sign that you're drifting from God. It's a sign you're getting closer to God. Refusing to repent for that sin is a sign that you're drifting from God, but not an increasing awareness of it. I mean, when Peter realized who Jesus was in the boat on their fishing trip, Peter said, depart from me, Lord, I'm a sinful man. Had anything changed about who Peter was in the boat from before they got in the boat? No, nothing changed about Christ. But once Peter's eyes were open, he was like, whoa, I'm bad. It seems like it wouldn't be the case, but a growing Christian, a grace-filled Christian has this painful awareness of our remaining sin. And some theologians have said the greatest burden of the real Christian is that they still have sin in their own remaining sin. And that's the burden of all burdens they want to be rid of more than anything. And there's probably some truth to that. So Paul writes here, he knows Christ redeemed us from all lawlessness, those of us who are saved. It sounds silly, but you can't be saved without realizing your lawlessness and your sin and your need for it. And so someone who believes they're not sinners, there's no way that they're Christians. Here's the next thing um, that, we, that we read in verse 14. Not only does the grace-filled Christian know he's a sinner, but he also knows Christ loves us, gave himself for us, and he knows the cross. I get that in verse 14. It says he, he gave who gave Christ is the one who gave himself up, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession. So here's the other thing you know is you know that we have lawlessness, but that Christ gave himself for us. The grace filled Christian knows in his heart and in his mind, Christ died for me personally, for me, for my sin. My personal sins are put on Jesus Christ at the cross. He had me in mind at the cross. He had other people in mind too, the whole church, but it, it included me. He died for me. He gave himself for me. He has saved me. All my sins are taken by him. The cross has erased them. That's what a grace-filled Christian understands, that, that they were redeemed from lawlessness. What is the, we've talked about this before, what is redemption? 
Do you know what redemption is in the Bible? How it functioned in the ancient world? Redemption, if somebody was kidnapped, there would have to be a price paid to redeem them, to release them from their captivity. And so someone would pay a price to redeem the person, and then the person was set free. So when it says Christ redeemed us from all lawlessness, it means he paid a price to redeem us from our lawlessness. Now the price Jesus paid was his death on the cross. Colossians 2 said he was all the sin that stood against us, the law and its legal demands, Jesus set it aside by nailing it to the cross. He set the legal demands aside by nailing it to the cross because he paid the legal demands. He was punished in your place. He paid for your sins. You don't have to go on the rest of your life trying to pay for your sins. That's actually denying the gospel. You know, have you heard people say, oh, I sinned, I gotta, I've got to atone for it? Like you can't atone for it. Christ atones for it. He pays for your sins. We, receiving his salvation by grace, we live a life of love and gratitude and faith that produces holiness in us, but we don't go back and try to pay God back for our sins. You can't pay God's price for sin. Christ paid for it at the cross. And so the grace-filled Christian is mastered by the cross of Christ and understands that he has redeemed me from my lawlessness. The cross is something he did for me. A grace krilled, krilled. Hey, did you guys miss that the last five weeks? I mean, <laughs> yeah, all my weird word salads. Grace filled Christians. Love the cross of Christ. They know that it's the center of their redemption and their salvation. It's the center of the saving grace of God. It's, this, it's not just a symbol. It's the reality. And the, uh, all that defines us, all that guarantees the, the second coming will be good for us, that, that, that we are saved by God's grace. The cross is at the center of all of it. The grace-filled Christian not only hopes in the second coming, but is deeply grounded in the cross of Christ and loves it. You got to deal with this cross, brother, as the guy in Do You Believe would say. The grace-filled Christian loves it. You have to know he gave himself for you. And he redeemed your sins all of them that you committed. He redeemed you from your, your sin. There's the last thing about the grace-filled Christian. Verse 14 says, Christ gave himself up for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. The grace-filled Christian understands you don't belong to yourself. Who did he belong to? Jesus. Yeah. He purified you for his own possession. You are his possession. Christ is very possessive. And it's good. He owns you. He possesses you. You belong to him. You're his people. And as his people, here's the grace-filled reality of Christians. It says, you are to be zealous for good works. What does that mean? It does not say, before you answer, it does not say he purified for himself a people who are indifferent towards good works because they're saved by grace. It does not say he purified himself a peop, purified for himself a people for his own possession who are lazy about good works because they don't care. It doesn't say that we are his own possession who are now begrudging of our own good works because of good works because we're so selfish. It doesn't say he has purified for himself a people who are ice cold towards good works because it'll inconvenience them and they're busy. It does not say that. 
If grace is working in you and it has saved you, you're mastered by the cross, you know you have sins, you're repenting of those sins, you're walking in obedience, you hope in the second coming, and you have zeal for good works. What is zeal? Passion? Okay. Yeah, you're hungry for it. You're passionate about it. You want it. I'm going to go get this. I'm coming after good works, man. Like, oh, man, let's get it. The opportunity to do good works. Now, we know in context, good works would mean obedience to God, just our own walk. But this is something, I think, different. This is beyond just... I'm upright before God and I'm living a godly life. What do you think this good works speaks to? Yeah, okay, yeah. Evangelizing would be part of it. What else? Okay. Yeah, laying out your life for other people. What else? There's lots of things you could say. Well, meet meeting physical need for someone who may be sick, someone who may be elderly, maybe yeah. certain needs that they, they may need. Yeah. Meet someone's needs. You can do it. You can help out. You can evangelize. You can comfort someone. You can minister to someone. You can pray for someone. You could do a chore for your mom. You're welcome. Needs are around you all the time. And look, the reality of God, the greatest reality of God is he saw a need and he met it with zeal. What's the need he saw? The need for humanity to be saved. And he met it through Jesus Christ. And it was really, really convenient for Jesus to save sinners. Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane said, man, I'm at peace and I am pumped because this is a blast. I'm going to save sinners, Lord. Thank you that I get to do this. This is so easy. I give you thanks. That was Gethsemane, right? Obviously, I'm kidding. Jesus is sweating blood to save you. He's enduring so much to save sinners. And he did it according to Hebrews 12 for the joy set before him is why he did it. And he did it till it cost him everything. He bled himself dry for his church with joy, even though he was in great agony at the same time. And yes, those two things can coexist. Now, if that is what our God did to save his people, and that God is alive in you, and his grace lives in you, how in the world can you look at needs around you and be cold, indifferent, and put off? And, how does that fit? It doesn't. It doesn't. There's a zeal for good works to be done. A hunger. I want, I'm not just like, oh man, I got to go do this. I'm on the hunt. I am looking for this. Where can I, I want to minister to that person. Oh, something comes up, man. Oh, I got it. I got it. And this other dude's like, no, I got it. It's like, bro, I got it. No, I got it. And like, okay, well you do half. And I got, you know, it's like, there's a zeal. A zeal for good works. Uh, look, there's so much glory in life that comes to the surface when people are like this in the presence of God. Like, I mean, I want to serve. I come. Have you ever had somebody meet your need and show up to minister to you? And they, they have joy and they have zeal behind it. Not just like, oh man, I've got to be here. This sucks. All right, what, what are we doing? Boy, that makes you just feel wonderful, doesn't it? When somebody meets your need that way, you're like, just go away. That's how I feel. But when somebody has a great joy about it, boy, it's a blessing. Christ died for that. He died to produce that in every believer. Without excuse. Notice, I'm going to read again what it doesn't say. It says, Jesus gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works if they have a certain personality. Don't say that. 
I'm so sick of psychology that has hijacked the Bible. Can you even find the word personality in the Bible? No. And yet you'll have entire ministries driven by personality. It doesn't say that. There's not a personality type that is zealous for good works. It's a reality of God's grace, not personality. Let me read it again, what it doesn't say. To purify him for himself a people, for his own possession, who are zealous for good works, if they have a lot of money to do that with. Doesn't say this either. Purify himself a people for his own possession, who are zealous for good works, unless they're too busy. All of the things that people would say to justify why they don't give a rip about somebody else and don't make a priority loving people and serving people, all of the excuses, none of them are found in the text. Not one. There is not one place in the Bible where being a type, I have been told I'm a type A I've been told I'm a lion. I've been told, I, I don't know, what was the color that I think I was red. I'm a type A red lion. I don't even know what that means. I can't remember what letter Julie was, but she was like a, a peach golden retriever or some stupid thing like that. And everybody was trying to define us and tell me and Julie when we were first started engaging the, engaging the church, Julie and I went to this marriage conference because we were like wanting to grow in marriage and we got told all this stupid stuff. I'm a type A red lion. How does that help me? Julie's a fuzzy peach golden retriever, whatever she is, it's stupid. And more importantly, it's not in this book. And it is hijacked. Somebody, you know how many books are written about this stuff? I read them. I could give you titles of them. It's not here. And it's not here to serve only if we have money. The Macedonian churches, when Jerusalem was in a, 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 a famine, the Macedonian churches were the poorest churches and they sacrificed to, to, to go help them. It, 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 if, and if we're so busy with frivolities that our schedule's so crammed with the frivolities of life that, that we can't love, then guess what? You're too busy with frivolities. This is what he died for. How many people have ever said, man, God's grace is so amazing. I'm zealously performing good works because of his grace. People don't talk like that. You understand? It's, it, what's producing the good works, the zeal for good works right here? Grace. Not personality types or pared down schedules or being rich. So now I actually have them. I have heard this stupid, you know, I'm, okay. You want to know how to spot a greedy, deceived, fake Christian? Hey, I have these resources. I don't use them for God at all right now. But if God would just give me more, boy, I will use it for God then. I have a house that I never use for God. But if he gives me a bigger one, then we'll use it for God. I have this big bank account that I never use for God. But if he gives me more, then I'll use it for God. Like I have seen that game so many times and the people who play it trust me you don't want to imitate their faith their faith he was faithful with little is faithful with much i get that we can't meet every single possible need we'll ever see i get that but it's like there's this zeal i am praying through some stuff right now i want to do all these things that i can't do it all and it's like i want to do it all like I, I i can't like that's where our heart needs to be is like I love my ministry. I love serving people. I want to. And I'm torn because I can't geographically be here and there at 3 p.m. I got to pick one. Oh. That's grace. That's grace. And in American dream, build your own little castle and isolate yourself from the rest of the world and only engage it on your terms. In that type of culture that professes Christ, there are 80 billion excuses as to why we don't love. And it isn't valid. Grace produces these things.
Someone could say, potentially at this point, dang, why are you all worked up about this? Why are you so strong on, on declaring these things and you're all, eh? Uh, verse 15 is what? Read it. Declare these things. Exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no one disregard you. Let me ask you, when you read that, does this sound like Paul's giving any room for argument here? Not at all. Declare it. Exhort people to do this stuff. Declare it. And it says with all authority. How do you declare these things with all authority? Here's how. This is God's word, not Paul's. It's God's word, not Titus's. It's God's word, God's word, not Reggie's. It's God's word, not yours. Declare it. It's authoritative because it's God's. Stand in it. Believe it. Be strong in it. Exhort. Rebuke with all authority. Where you see grace short-circuiting somewhere, rebuke it. Where you see it's, it's operative. Okay, cool. Exhort it. Yes, serve. Come on. Engage. Love. Serve. Preach. Repent. Obey. Look at the coming. Engage. Hey. That's what Paul's telling Titus to do. We need moms that do that. We need dads that do that. We need kids that are like that. That Be a leader. That's verse 15. Be a leader. Be about these things. Understand it for yourself and grab other people and say, let's do this. Don't let people talk you out of it. Don't let people twist your head. Don't let the personality people or the money people or the time people, whatever their excuse is, don't let it get to you. Rather, stand with all authority, declaring it. And when people don't like you for this, and that will happen, verse 15 doesn't say, therefore declare these things. Exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no one disregard you. But if they say you're mean, then go ahead and apologize and back off. It doesn't say that. Stand. Be a man. Be a woman. Stand in it. Be about something. Let your life count for Jesus Christ. Rather than being this wishy-washy, flimsy, I spent my whole life on Facebook and TV and frivolities and chasing castles and, and dumb stuff. And I never served the Lord and I justified my sins and I lied to myself that the grace of God has saved me. And then I go before the Lord and he's like, I never knew you. Depart from me. Get out of here. There's one way. Lord has saved us. Sweet. Yep. I'm not perfect, but I do repent of my sins and I'm obeying God. And I know that second coming. I know it's coming now. It's coming. It's going to happen. Every second that goes by, we get closer to it. Every second that goes by, I get closer to my death. Cool. I want to maximize my life. I'm zealous for good works. I want to serve. Let's get, man, how are we going to do this? How are we going to get the gospel here? How are we going to serve that? Oh, man, we got all these needs over here. All right, cool. Let's figure it out. Let's get it done. Put the excuses away. I don't care about it. Figure it out. Find a way. Love, serve. Let's do it. That's what you got to be. Grace produces that. Hey. So, question. What do I do if part of this sermon convicts me? What do I need? I'll give you a hint. We sang about it. You need to repent. Yeah, you need grace, grace, God's grace. You need a grace that will forgive your sins. That as a believer, there have been times we've been so enamored with dumb stuff, we could our hearts grown cold and we don't serve, or that we've stayed in sin too long, or that we've delayed our obedience. We need forgiveness for that. But then we need what else? What other expression of grace do we need?
Okay, yeah. We need, we need divine grace to fill us and move us into becoming what God is shaping us into. We need his power and presence to do this. So when you feel convicted that you're falling short of this, confess it and trust the cross. And now you got to seek God for grace. I need your help, Lord, to pour your grace into my soul so I can grow in whatever that thing is you're convicted about. And then you believe God is going to give you that grace and you go do it without excuse or without... Um, yeah, without excuse. Just leave it at Zealous for good works. If you don't feel zealous for good works, if you don't feel that way, go do it anyway. And ask God while you're doing the good works that you don't feel like doing, ask him to meet you and fill you with zeal. I've done that a million times in my life where I'm on the way somewhere to go do a good work that I don't feel like going there. And I know that that's wrong. And I'm like, Lord, I don't feel like doing this. And it bugs me that I don't feel like doing it. I hate this about myself, but I'm going to do it anyway because I love you. Meet me and fill me. And five minutes into doing it, all of a sudden I'm like, bye. Yeah, even though I didn't feel that way in the beginning. You got to live by faith and trust that that grace is going to meet you. Even when you don't feel like fleeing your sins, when you don't feel like obeying a commandment, we don't feel like that good work Trust the grace will meet you. It's done it to me a million, million times. You just got to show up and believe. God's spirit, by his grace, will fill you. Your life will look completely different when you learn to live like that instead of just learning by living by how you feel. This is what grace does and what grace is. I'm jacked up, you're jacked up, we all get together and know we're jacked up, and you're getting drunk, and you're beating up the students in your class, and you're cheating and stealing from your company, but hey, none of us are perfect, it's all the grace of God. Now you're equipped to smash that, right, With, from this passage? It's nonsense. Please memorize this text and the flow and linger over it because the biggest heresy in our day is destroyed by this passage. So anyways, but you have any questions or comments? That is the grace of God. Ladies and gentlemen. Okay, well, let's pray and then we'll have a time at the table. Father, we thank you so much for your grace. We thank you that it saves us. We thank you that the cross is at the center of it. We thank you, Holy Spirit, that you have awakened us and placed us in Christ. We thank you that you work in us to cause us to repent, to cause us to obey, to make us zealous for good works, to hope in the second coming. All this stuff is a byproduct of grace. We thank you that grace does this because apart from your grace doing this in us, we would never have the power to do these things on our own. Thank you that you love us so much. You don't just save us from our sins. You save us out of our sins and you love us enough to change us and to challenge us and to grow us rather than just leave us how we are in, in sin and worldliness and deadness. Thank you for that. Lord, we love you. And uh, we pray that your grace will be powerful towards us this week. And we pray in Jesus' name, amen.